Hello and welcome to another classic golf clubs video. This one starts off on a bit of a tangent, but bear with me. On a break in Devon recently, I visited Knights Hayes Court, which is a National Trust property. I wasn't aware of its significance to golf, but as soon as I saw that the previous owners had been the Heathcote Armoury family, I felt a buzz of excitement, and sure enough, the house once belonged to Sir John and Lady Joyce Heathcote Armoury. Joyce is of course better known by her maiden name of Joyce Weatherhead, who many argue was the greatest female golfer of all time. While most of the house and gardens are given over to the usual attractions to be expected in a National Trust property, there was a small room dedicated to Joyce's time in golf, small may be, but containing some fascinating items. Born in November 1901 in Surrey, England, into a wealthy family, she first played golf aged around 10 on a short nine-hole course in Bude, North Cornwall, laid out for children and ladies of high handicaps. I wonder if the Summerlees Downs Pitch and Puck course in Bude could be this very course. Sport pretty much stopped for the duration of the First World War, but at its end, a 17-year-old Joyce and her elder brother Roger, who was two years her senior, began playing again and under the watchful eye of her brother, Joyce began to take the game seriously. A lot of her golf was played at Dornock in Scotland where her family had a home by the golf course. Roger was a powerful if wayward driver of the ball and a master of iron play. Joyce played regularly with Roger and his friends many of whom were of international standard, and this no doubt contributed to her great length compared to other female golfers of the time. The swing of Joyce Weatherhead has to be one of the finest of all time, especially bearing in mind she was playing top-level golf over a hundred years ago. It wouldn't look out of place even today. One might think that she was a born golfer, and to some extent that may be true, but she worked very hard to attain the level of perfection that she did. She only had maybe one or two formal lessons, but through playing with her brother, who was one of the best amateurs of the time, she was able to watch the best players, and made it her duty to study, practice and emulate the finer points of their swings, until she was happy in every department of her game. Although of slim build, Joyce was 5 feet 11 inches tall, and used every inch of that height in her graceful and controlled swing. Now well aware of her strengths, she was confident to go out and face all comers. Although a quiet and modest person, she had all the qualities required to be a great champion. In Britain during the 1920s, most of the golf played was on an amateur basis. Joyce Weatherhead's entrance into the public's gaze was both su surprising and dramatic. By far the dominant figure at the time was Cecil Leach not just in her golfing prowess, but also her personality, which was such that her opponents could easily collapse as Cecil strode the fairways. The rivalry between Cecil Leach and Joyce Weatherhead would fascinate the public for years to come. It first came to attention in June 1920, when Joyce entered the English Ladies Amateur, held that year at Sheringham Golf Club. This was the first major championship that she'd entered. The relatively unknown and, un and certainly unfancied Joyce Weatherhead got through the qualifying round with a very indifferent 94, which certainly didn't give any hint of what was to follow. But Joyce progressed comfortably into the finals, beating some notable players along the way. In the final, her opponent was of course the formidable Cecil Leach, and only one outcome was predicted, a sure victory for Cecil. Cecil birdied the first hole of the 36-hole final and was four up at the turn, but she failed to win any more holes in the second nine, which gave heart to Joyce, who said that she felt quite satisfied, not because she had any thoughts about winning, but that she was putting up a good show. In the afternoon round, Cecil went further ahead to lead by six. But in a cocoon of concentration, Joyce took full advantage of the dry and fast running fairways to hit some very long tee shots and gained the reward with a string of threes, which turned the tide in her favour, and she went on to win by two and one. Joyce's concentration gave rise to one of the f most famous quotes associated with her. When over the put for the match on the 35th green, a train rattled noisily past. Asked if it had disturbed her, she replied, what train? Joyce Weatherhead went on to dominate the English amateur, ladies amateur for four more years, going undefeated to her final victory in 1924, a remarkable run of 33 straight wins in the competition.
The greater competition, though, was the Women's Amateur Championship, attracting an, in an international field. In 1921 at Turnbury, Joyce reached the final, where she was again up against Cecil Leach. This time Joyce admits to being thoroughly outplayed and lost the 36-hole final by 4-3. and three. In the following year, the women's amateur was held at Prince's Sandwich, a course that favours the longer hitters, which made it even less of a surprise that the finalists should once again be Cecil Leach and Joyce Weatherhead. The morning round was an intense battle where both players were exceptional, and Joyce finished leading by just one hole. She says that her driving distance had increased since Turnbury, and her iron play too was much stronger. In the afternoon round, Cecil was unable to maintain her level, and Joyce ended up winning out a comfortable winner by 9 and 7. In 1923, Joyce was surprisingly beaten by Mrs Macbeth. Things were back to script in 1924, when Joyce won at Burnham and Barrow by 7 and 6, which brings us to 1925 at Troon, and another of her most memorable matches. Once again, the finalists were Joyce Weatherhead and Cecil Leach and the interest among the spectators was intense, the players frequently being left behind as the spectators rushed ahead as soon as shots were hit, jostling and squashing them in the process. Joyce later called it the most exhausting game in her life. Both players were on form, and Cecil kept edging ahead only to be pulled back again, and it wasn't until the tenth hole of the afternoon round that Joyce finally took the lead, and after the fifteenth the lead was up to two with three holes remaining. She missed a good chance to end the match on the 16th hole after Cecil played a poor third but, and Joyce could only put her own third into a bunker and ended up halving the hole. Cecil then won the 17th and 18th to square the match and out they went again to the 37th hole. Here at last Joyce was able to win the match and the championship. Afterwards she announced that this would be a final appearance in a major championship but that retirement was short lived. In 1929 she once again entered the Women's Amateur Championship, this year held at St Andrews, and the match that she's probably best remembered for. In the final she met the highly fancied American Glenna Collett. It's often been said that Joyce came out of retirement to defend the honour of the home countries against the American invasion, but in her book Golfing Memories and Methods, Joyce strongly refutes this suggestion and states that the reason for her entry was down purely to the fact that she looked forward to competing at St Andrews for several years and nothing whatsoever to do with preventing the trophy from going to America. Both players moved steadily, if uns unspectacularly, through the opening matches and, as everybody had hoped, eventually reached the final, where they both produced their best golf, as all the great golfers are prone to do. In the final, Glenna Collett started in superb form, going out in 34 strokes. Joyce said that those nine holes were the finest sequence of holes she'd seen any lady play. Glenna was five up at the turn, and Joyce was worried that her putting stroke had deserted her. Joyce writes that the twelfth hole was the crux of the match as far as she was concerned. She'd taken three putts and left Glenna with a putt of three or four feet to win the hole and go six up, but she missed it and gave Joyce her first ray of hope. Of course, Glenna could not maintain her outstanding play of the front nine and a rejuvenated Joyce managed to claw back three of the five-hole deficit to be just two down at lunch. Still not a good position. But Joyce's fine play continued for the first nine holes of the afternoon round and she amazingly found herself four up after nine, with nine holes remaining. But Glenna then made two excellent threes to pull the score back to two. On the difficult 17th, the road hole, the lead was still two. Glenna found difficulties and took four to reach the green. When Joyce holed the winning put, the huge crowd went wild and it was some time before the competitors were able to escape from the green. And so Joyce was able to achieve her long-held ambition of winning a championship at St Andrews and this time she really did retire from top-level golf. Not long after this victory, the Weatherhead family lost much of its fortune due to the Wall Street crash. Joyce, ever the realist and practical, took a job in the golf department of Fortnum & Mason, which resulted in the RNA removing her amateur status in 1934, and she didn't regain it until 1954. In 1935, she made a three-month tour of America, sponsored by the John Wanamaker Department Store of Philadelphia, for whom Weatherhead also took on a marketing role. 
Not long after her return to England, she married to John Heathcote Armory and moved to Knights Hayes Court, as already mentioned. Aside from all the high-profile championships, Joyce Weatherhead probably gained as much pleasure from playing in the Werpleston Mixed Foursomes, a club where she and Roger were long-standing members. Her record in the competition was exceptional, winning eight times with seven different male partners. She also entered several times partnering her husband, Sir John, and although they reached the final one year, they were never able to win the tournament together. In 1975, Joyce Weatherhead was inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame. She died in 1997, two days after her 96th birthday. I can't end this short look at the life of Joyce Weatherhead without quoting two of the best-known compliments paid to her. Following a round in 1930 at St Andrews in a stiff wind in which all players teed from the rear tees, Joyce Weatherhead shot a fine 75, and Bobby Jones was moved to say... I have not played golf with anyone, man or woman, amateur or professional, who made me feel so utterly outclassed. And Henry Cotton also was impressed by Joyce's play, and he said, In my time, no golfer has stood out so far ahead of his or her contemporaries as Lady Heathcote Armoury. Well, that ends this look at the uh, life and career of Joyce Weatherhead. Let's return now to the golf room at Knights Hayes Court, which set this video in motion. Small it may be, but there are some very interesting items within. Some of these I've already shown as background pictures while relating her career, but one of the most exciting things in the room for me was this set of golf clubs which apparently belonged to Joyce. Such well-meaning claims can sometimes be an error, but I think that these clubs actually were played by Joyce. They're a set of Gibson Joyce Weatherhead clubs, produced in the mid-1930s. Joyce was under contract with Gibson for some years, and this advert for Gibson Joyce Weatherhead Club states to around 1936. The clubs here are a mix of steel shafts in the wooden clubs and hickory shafts in the irons, which is how Joyce preferred her clubs at the time. It's also interesting to know that a Wilson sand iron appears in the set. Wilson were at the forefront of sand iron development, and it's no surprise that Joyce would have such a club in her bag. I do like the simple design of the clubs, and especially the W sole plate in the woods. So how can I uh, emulate this set when, when I play my on-course section in part two of this video? Let's have a look at the clubs that I'm going to be playing. So I have here uh, a driver, uh, typical of the time, early steel shafted. We've got a uh, bone sole plate there, no insert, it's a persimmon block. And we can see on the top there that it is by Gibson. So it's the same manufacturer as Joyce Weatherhead's Woods. But this one was produced for sale in uh, Royal Calcutta Golf Club. So it was exported at some time and probably brought back by somebody who was perhaps possibly working in, in the area and brought back to the UK when they returned. It is an early steel shafted club. There isn't any label on it. It's got a, a old leather grip. It's slightly shorter than a modern club. I'll bring the length up so you can see that because I've not measured it yet. But there is a bit of a, a worry on this one and that's the fact that it has been repaired at some point. You can possibly see there a crack down the neck of the wood and the whipping is very, um, well, unusual looking shall we say with that uh, step in there it looks as though it had a number of wraps and we can also see the crack on this side so hopefully this is going to hold up uh, for play uh, so that's the driver the three wood is again a steel shafted club again it's got a uh, plain wooden face and but this one does have a more traditional looking sole plate uh, we've got the three there and on the crown We've got the maker's name, Gradage. It's a little bit battered, this one. Um, but the shaft itself is pretty good. It's a true temper shaft, made in England. So this would have been produced by Ackles and Pollock. And the flex on that one is whippy. So that's the two woods that I'll be using. Hopefully they'll hold together during the round. Now let's move on to the irons then. The clubs we saw in the museum with Joyce Weatherhead's name were a, a full matched set in that the heads were all uh, designed to be played with the rest of the set. So we had a, a nice progression from the longest iron to the shortest iron. 
And that was a feature that really started to come into play from the early 1930s. Before then, clubs were generally sold uh, as individual clubs. I unfortunately don't have a full match set, so I'm going to be using a piecemeal collection of clubs. I've tried to make them all stainless uh, steel, as per the Joyce Weatherhead set that we saw, and they are apart from this one, which is a, a raw uh, steel. So let's quickly go through them and see what we've got. I haven't got a full set far from it, I've just got five irons. And the first of those <coughs> is this one, which is uh, a Jigger. See that name on the bottom there, if you can catch that in the light properly. And this was a club that was uh, a, a fairly late addition to uh, the Hickory Arsenal. It has a, a, a tapered head with quite a bit of weight at the bottom, which meant it was a useful club for uh, playing a higher shot, uh, getting the ball into the air more quickly. But towards the end of its life, it really became known as a club for playing short shots around the green. And many of these were cut down from their uh, normal length, uh, which would have been probably somewhere around about 38 inches to something like 35 inches just to be used around the green. This one fortunately has the full length shaft. <coughs> Next club I've got is this one. I can't remember or I can't find whose cleat mark this shield is. Um, but we can see the name of the professional there, G.E. Bowser, who I think was uh, based in the Leicestershire area for a while. Special was stamped on a lot of clubs. What the 13 means is anybody's guess. But we do have the um, approximate yardage that a player would expect to achieve with this club, which appeared on uh, a number of clubs towards the end of the Hickory era. And this is up between 110 and 130 yards. The club itself is a mashy. Um, there wasn't a standard loft for these clubs at this time. In fact, I do have two in this small set that I'm playing. On the face of this one, it's a dot face club. Um, quite a worn club. Uh, what else can I say about it? Not a lot, really. Move on to the next one. This one is again a mashy. It has a number two on it. So for the... Uh, purpose of the video I'm going to call this the number two mashy. I can't remember whose cleat mark that one is either. Uh, I'm not doing very well on cleat marks obviously. Uh, on the face of this one we can see that it's another punch dot face. These are more like square uh, punch marks and they're not very deep on this one. Next club I've got is uh, this one which we can see is a mashy niblick. Rustless again. And approximate uh, flight, it's saying on this one, 80 yards. Uh, it's produced by the club professional E. Bradbeer of Hendon. And again, we can see it's a dot face, punch dot face, rather randomly. Well, they're not really randomly, but they're not uh, regularly spaced punch marks there. Moving finally on to the last club, which is the Niblick which would be the most lofty club that was available at the time. This one says Kinghorn Golf Company. And this was one of the the more budget range of clubs produced by Gibsons, who were one of the uh, largest uh, and best manufacturers of uh, iron heads during the Hickory era. If we look on the face of this one, it's another punch dot one, and these are slightly more regularly spaced. But the big thing to notice on this, it is the most lofty club. It was the Trouble Club, but look how thin the sole is on it. There's no bounce on the club at all. Uh, so this is the club that will be used out of bunkers a lot of the time. Uh, the, the technique at the time was more to pick the ball off the surface than splash it out as we do now. So... Uh, bounce wasn't really developed until uh, sometime in the mid-1930s. Gene Sarazen and Wilson are often given the, the credit for it. Whether they were the, were the originators or not, I don't know. But it was around the, the, the early to mid-1930s that the, uh, the bounce appeared on clubs. And as we saw in Joyce Weatherhead's set, she had a, a Wilson sand iron with... Uh, a nice amount of bounce on it and a much thicker sole than this club. Right, so that's the irons. Now let's have a look at the putter. Here then is the putter I'll be using and you'll be pleased to see that at last I've got Joyce Weatherhead's name on a club. 
uh, her signature there very similar to the how the signature appears on the Gibson Woods um, it doesn't have a, a Gibson mark on it anywhere on, on this club uh, it is a steel shafted club uh, so 1930s I would say we have got a couple of uh, monograms there or something like that a J and a B you, you could say that this is also a W uh, so it could be Joyce Weatherhead uh, what the B stands for I'm not sure who made the club <coughs> I've, I've done a lot of uh, digging around on the internet and everywhere to try and find this the best uh, guess I can come up with is that this was produced uh, for sale in the uh, John Wanamaker stores in America Joyce Weatherhead towards the end of her uh, amateur career um, the uh, family lost a lot of its money in the uh, the great crash uh, not long after that she went on a tour of America I think around about 1934 or 35 and during that tour uh, she agreed to represent uh, the John Wanamaker store which is why I think this club could very well be produced um, in America and who knows the JW might even be John Wanamaker uh, it's a, a straightforward lined face but uh, the sweet spot as I think I've mentioned before on this club is quite a bit towards the heel it's not where you expect it to be in the middle it's somewhere about here uh, so the uh, closer to the hosel than you would expect brown coated shaft the grip on it I think this is the original grip as far as the length of the club goes it's 33 and 3 quarter inches so it's definitely a, a ladies putter men's putters at this time were around about 35 inches long uh, and there we go that's the putter and at last we've got a Joyce Weatherhead club let's have a look at the lofts to end not bad gapping for a small set uh, but a big gap between the mashy two at 39 degrees and the mashy niblick at 48 and not much of a gap between the mashy niblick and the niblick just three degrees but i should be able to uh, make something out of this set thanks for watching i hope you stick around to watch part two bye